Hello there. Hello. <laughs> it's a new season. It's a new introit. A song must rise. Once again, and welcome to this time of worship. You know, there was hardly anybody here, and then at 5 to 10, boom, <laughs> there you all are. So, welcome. And those of you worshiping online with us, welcome too. It's great to be sharing in this time with you. Everyone, regardless of your age, ethnicity, background, orientation, gender identity, or expression, life experience, whatever, you're welcome here at Harmony. What are we going to celebrate today? We're going to celebrate yesterday. Absolutely. Yesterday was awesome. And that's another reason I'm surprised to see so many people here. How was the dance? Wicked good. Totally tubular. Too much? Nah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yesterday was fantastic. I agree. Absolutely. And we'll hear more about that a little bit later. Michaela and Allie are celebrating their birthdays, like today? Michaela's is today and Allie's is Wednesday. Wish them happy birthday for us, please. Allie was here briefly yesterday, so. Jane Dalton's birthday is tomorrow, but she, oh, she's. It's the 17th, Tuesday. Happy birthday, Jane, when you wake up. Okay. <laughs> Amen. We don't have a, do we have a microphone for that? Your brother, Jerry, who's sitting right there beside you? Yeah? <laughs> Well, happy 80th, Jerry. Seventeen on the seventeenth. Well, wish him happy. Alice's grandson, happy birthday. Yes, he does. That's Graham, right? Graham Walker's birthday. Uh-oh, redstone, yep. Wow. Absolutely. Okay, and, yeah, Norma? Jocelyn is turning 100. That's, that's a good run. I saw somebody else's hand go up, and I can't. Paul. 
Yes, we are celebrating Eleanor's back. Yay, welcome back, Eleanor. <laughs> Well, we have a lot to celebrate and sing about, so why don't we sing? Happy celebration to you. Happy celebration to you. Happy celebration, God bless you. Happy celebration to you. Shut up. As we gather for worship, we remember that here in this region, we live and work and worship on lands that are by law the unceded territories of the Wabanaki peoples, predominantly the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. As we gather in community, we center ourselves for worship with the lighting of the Christ candle. Its flame reminds us that the Spirit of Christ is not far from each of us, and that Christ's work continues, shared by all of us. And we light the affirming candle as a reminder that everyone is beloved of God and created in the image of God, and of our call to be public, intentional, and explicit as we walk a path of justice and peace. You invite us to worship, O God, and we rejoice. You invite us to worship, O God, and we give thanks. You invite us to worship, O God, and we remember. You invite us to worship, O God, and we respond. Let us pray. God of mighty deeds and gentle mercies, we gather to give you praise this day. We join with all of creation in uttering our small words of thanks for your steadfast love, which endures forever. May our very lives be lived as a song of praise to you. Amen. For our opening hymn today, we will sing, Open My Eyes That I May See.
For our story today, we're back with the Israelites wandering around in the desert. From Exodus chapter 32, this is called, The People Are Impatient. Moses had gone up the mountain to talk with God. Leading the people of Israel to a new land and a new life was not easy. The people often grumbled and complained and wondered if Moses knew what he was doing. Moses would listen to God to find out where to go and what to do next. Moses had been gone for a long time, and the people were becoming impatient. What would they do if Moses didn't come back? They weren't going to wait any longer. They talked to one another and decided to go and speak to Aaron. They asked Aaron to make a god who would lead them to their destination. They didn't know how Aaron would do it, but Moses had made Aaron leader for the time he was away, so they were confident that he would think of something. Aaron sent them away and said he would call them back in a short time. He thought for a while and then he had an idea. He asked the people to collect gold jewelry from their family members, rings, necklaces, earrings, and bracelets. The people were excited. At last, someone was going to help them so they could move on. They rushed around, collected the jewelry, and took the items back to Aaron. Aaron worked hard and the people watched eagerly to see what he would do. At last, he was finished. He had made a gold calf. The people crowded around to look at it. They thought that it was beautiful, and they began to pray to the calf and bring presents to it. They were worshiping the calf. This is the God who brought us out of Egypt, they said. Aaron made a stone platform, put the calf on it, and announced a festival the next day to praise God. The people had a party. They ate and drank and had a very happy time. God was angry. God had sent a message with Moses just a little while ago that the people should be worshiping the one true God. Moses wanted to protect the people and asked God to stop being so angry and remember that these are the people God had brought out of slavery in Egypt. Moses also reminded God of the promises God had made to Abraham. God had promised Abraham they would have many descendants, as many as the stars in the sky, and that they would have a land, a place to call home. Moses asked God to calm down and forgive the people. This was a very hard time for Moses. What would happen? Fortunately, God's mind was changed. Moses was very pleased and went back to the people and reminded them again that they must follow God. I just have to get something up here on my phone. What are some things you've had to wait for lately? Besides me trying to get something on my phone. Wait for supper. Hmm, Doctor's appointments. Spider-Man 2. Waiting for a phone call. Pardon? Peace, yes. Stranger Things season five. No kidding, right? Oh. <laughs> it's hard to get when waiting for patience. Yes, please. Oh, you mean telling her to have patience. So how do you feel about waiting? Impatient. Impatient. Yep. Yep. Okay. I want to try something. I want you to close your eyes. And after I say go, I want you to wait for 15 seconds, okay? When you think 15 seconds are up, put up your hand, okay? You ready? Close your eyes. Go. Okay, not bad. All right, we're gonna try it one more time, but this time 30 seconds. Whoa, I know, I know, right? <laughs> well, I'll turn up the alarm so it wakes you up. Where's my volume? Okay. Okay.
Oops, I tried to turn up the volume. I'll leave it on the... Okay, you ready? Okay, close your eyes. 30 seconds. Go. So, <laughs> I heard somebody snoring. I heard it. I know who it was, too. So, how was that? Was that easy? Was that hard? Was that... You just waited for that, and then you put up your hand. Yeah, that's clever. That's a hack. It's, it's, it's <laughs> a nice little nap. Yeah? Good. There was no pressure. That's good. You imagine waiting for 40 days and 40 nights for that little alarm? It's, it's kind of like that, okay, who's, let's play the quiet game, right? <laughs> yep, there you go. So uh, first question, what do you do to make waiting easier? Read a book. Play games. Listen to music, watch TV, pardon, twiddle your fingers, I knit, yep, okay. How do you, well I already asked you that, how do you think the people waiting for Moses were feeling? Upset, scared, frustrated, At lost, anxious, yep. Do you think there's, pardon me, impatient? <laughs> Do you think there's something else they could have done to make waiting easier? Pardon? Pray? Encourage each other. Party? Or talk? Yeah, no, that's what they did, right? <laughs> yep. I don't have any answers for you. I just was curious to see what you had to say. I'm going to put my phone back on silent now. Um, I did get a message during that time about something we're waiting for. That is for Godot. You can take it up with Gord later. You can ask him what he meant by that. <laughs> anyway. All right. Let's, let's pray. You, can, you know what? You can repeat after me anyway, even though there's no kids up with me. Let's pray. Dear God, Sometimes it's hard to wait. Please help us to be patient. Please remind us that you are always with us. In easy times and in hard times. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen. Thank you. I don't know, Connie, if anybody wants to go up with you. They can. Okay. <laughs> anybody. Anybody wants to go to Sunday school with Connie. You think I'm joking. I really mean it. If you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good. All right. We can, we can go on to the, we did that already. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would invite you to stand as you're comfortable and join with me in, in reciting our, our common faith as expressed in a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, 
to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. For those reasons, my sisters and brothers, you whom I so love and long for, you who are my joy and my crown, continue, my dear ones, to stand firm in Jesus Christ. I implore Eudea and Syntyche to come to an agreement with each other in Christ. And I ask you, Sezegas, to be a true comrade and help these co-workers. These two women struggled at my side in defending the good news, along with Clement and the others who worked with me. Their names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Savior, always. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see your forbearing spirit. Our Savior is near. Dismiss all anxiety from your minds. Instead, present your needs to God through prayer and through petition, giving thanks for all circumstances. Then, God's own peace, which is beyond all understanding, will stand guard over your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, my brothers and sisters, your thoughts should be wholly directed to all that is true, all that deserves respect, all that is honest, pure, decent, admirable, virtuous, or worthy of praise. Live according to what you have learned and accepted what you have heard me say and seen me do, then will the God of peace be with you. From my family to yours, shalom.
I'll just leave that fern there. <laughs> So I remember hearing that story about the people and the golden calf in Sunday school years and years and years ago, and years and years, <laughs> and being told how wicked and forgetful and ungrateful the people were for worshiping it instead of God. We were told how angry God was, and we should never, ever, ever worship false idols because that would make God angry at us, and we certainly didn't want that worked for me when I was in Sunday school. I would dare to say it scared the hell out of me. But, <laughs> did you just get that? Yeah, <laughs> okay. But as an adult, I've come to look at that story just a little bit differently. And I can, I can empathize with and even maybe relate to a little bit Aaron and the Israelites. They've made camp near the base of Mount Sinai we skipped a few weeks because the lectionary does that to us. In chapter 20 of Exodus, they, the people had received the Ten Commandments that were intended to give order and value and identity to their life as a people. In chapters 21 through 31, they receive a whole parcel of other laws, practices, and instructions. When we catch up with them today in chapter 32, they're still camped out near the mountain, and Moses has once again gone up the mountain to meet with God. He's been up there a long time. As you indicated earlier, the people, they're starting to get restless, impatient, fearful. They start to wonder if he's ever coming back. And if he doesn't come back, how will they get to where they're going? As their impatience and fear, I think, grows, they start making demands on Moses' brother Aaron. They're seeking assurance of God's presence, but in the form of idols of other religions from the ancient Near East, which they would have been very familiar with and comfortable with. They want something they can hold on to, something they can see and feel and experience with their physical senses. The golden calf, or bull, was an image of strength and virility common in religions of that area. And so that would the, the intent, I think, was to soothe their troubled hearts by giving them something familiar. It does give them what they need for a time. My feeling is, God's anger and Moses' intervention aside, they would have tired of, of that calf after a while and look for something else. But I don't know that for sure, because God does care enough about the people to get angry. Moses does intervene and God's mind is changed. I get why the people wanted that calf. I get, oh boy, do I get why Aaron tried to appease the people in their grumbling. I understand their impatience, their need for instant gratification. And I can appreciate their longing for God in a way that they can hold on to and feel and see and experience in a tangible way. We may not worship literal golden calves anymore, but I think we all have to contend with idols that compete for our attention, things that can satisfy our impatience and offer us instant results, things like stuff and status, entertainment, insert yours here. These things can give us what we need for a time. Our society tells us we need to be self-sufficient, look out for number one and that we can do it all by ourselves, all on our own. But one of the central tenets of our faith is being in relationship with each other and with God. To be in a relationship with anyone, including those in our church community, and even with God, it takes a lot of effort and hard work. God knows. God seeks relationship with us in spite of it all. Building a strong relationship takes time, trust, and perhaps a little heartache. The Israelites, as we know, they were a community. They were learning to live into their identity as God's covenant people. And the early Christians in Philippi, to whom Paul was writing, were learning how to live together as a community of disciples, just like we are today. Paul was writing this letter from prison 
appealing to the church to support and encourage one another. Jill Crenshaw writes in Feasting on the Word, waiting, even longing to be with his beloved community. Paul is well into long, difficult days between his last visit to Philippi and when he will again feast with his friends there. The Philippian church, like Paul, is also suffering. The joy that energized the community when Paul first proclaimed the gospel in their midst is waning, partly because of his long absence. And what does Paul tell the church to do? Rejoice, always. Rejoice. Seriously, Paul, we may say, you're in prison, the community is struggling, you want us to rejoice. There's so much anger and pain and fear and conflict all around us, and you want us to be joyful. Yes, I do, Paul would reply. No, Paul, really? We might persist. Look at everything that is going on in this world. Natural disasters, hunger and homelessness, terror and war, innocence dying and displaced. I'm more inclined to rage than rejoice. Yes, really, Paul would insist. I know that living a joyful life in a world rife with hostility is not easy. But the antidote is to pray, rejoice, and focus on that which is truly good. This is one of my favorite passages from Philippians. I admit I struggle with it sometimes because the call to rejoice always can feel like a prohibition against feeling and expressing the wide range of human emotions that we all experience. We can hear rejoice always as what, what's the phrase that I'm hearing? Toxic positivity? Just a way to belittle and minimize our struggles. So we as modern disciples must consider this text and wrestle with it a little bit and search for ways to describe the kind of spiritual joy that Paul is referring to. For Paul, writes Nathan Eddy, also in Feasting on the Word, joy and life beyond constant worry come not when one has mastered this or that spirituality or when they arrive special delivery from God, but when one perceives God's action even amid difficulty and pain. This is a countercultural kind of joy. We hear that word, we think of personal good feelings in response to happy circumstances. But for Paul, our joy is rooted in our belief that no matter what, God is near. It's not just an emotional response depending on circumstances, it's a way of life, one that must be cultivated and nurtured. And joy is cultivated and nurtured in community. Eddie points out that in the original Greek, the command to rejoice, as well as all of the other directives in this passage, they're written in the plural. Joy is incomplete unless it is shared, he says. Joy itself is not the goal, it is an outcome and a sign of the presence of the risen Christ. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says. Keep on living as a community who loves God and its neighbors. Keep on doing these ordinary acts of caring that bear the extraordinary gifts of God's love. Keep on doing the work of the gospel together. Persist in joy, knowing that God is near. Joy is also cultivated and nurtured through prayer. A relationship and prayer as a relationship with God, not a technique to be mastered. Okay, I will freely admit last week it got a little bit chaotic with those prayer leaves. It did. <laughs> for those of you who were not with us, we were asked to write something for which we were thankful on one leaf and something for which we wished to pray on the other, and then we shared some of them during the prayers or the pastoral prayers and it became very much a desire to read into the microphone. <laughs> it was awesome, I agree. Because I think I really enjoy and appreciate the way we can share our prayers of thanksgiving and concern with each other in community. It reminds us we're not alone in our struggles and it reminds us of what we have to be grateful for. 
Bringing God our joys and our sorrows and being attentive to God's presence changes the way we look at the world. And when we change the way we look at the world, it changes the way we act in the world. And when we change the way we act in the world, we change the world. In a book called Amazing Grace, A Vocabulary of Faith, author Kathleen Norris, <laughs> sorry, we have a Kathleen Morris that I was looking at there. Kathleen Norris, she says, while prayer may originate in our own desires, it quickly moves beyond them into our life with others and toward the greater society. She illustrates this sort of inward, outward dynamic of prayer using the work of a sixth century monk, Dorotheus. And I'll ask Brandon to show me the circle. Okay. So Dorotheus imagined the world as a circle with God at the center and our lives as lines drawn from the circumference toward that center, like spokes on a wheel. As Dorotheus relates it, says Norris, the closer the lines crowd in toward God, the closer they are to one another. And the closer they are to one another, the closer they become to God. And when you get down to the heart of the matter, that is cause for rejoicing. Always. Amen. Nothing to see here. Should we just have the anthem then? That's my fault. That's, I have a different order of service here in my book. It'll play twice. <laughs> yeah, show of hands. Yeah, okay. Oh my. Okay, rewinding. The closer the lines crowd in toward God, the closer they are to one another. And the closer they are to one another, the closer they become to God. And that, my friends, is cause for rejoicing. Always let us pray. God who calls and guides, your awesome power is visible all around us. You amaze us for you persist with us. Despite our fickleness and our wavering, you listen to us. You offer life and hope because your love is enduring, longing for all that is best for us. Holy One, we are your people, seeking to know you more fully and to praise you in our daily living. We need your wisdom and guidance to help us untangle from the uncertainties, anxieties, and fears that hold us back. So here we turn, sensing your presence, even when our eyes are unable to see you. We listen for your voice within, even when our ears are unable to detect your speaking. We long to trust you on our journey into the future, known and yet unknown. We come to you in prayer, compassionate God, knowing that you are always near. Receive the requests we make known to you in our hearts, our prayers for our world, our community, our families, ourselves. We hold in prayer the people of Afghanistan devastated by earthquake. As we continue to hear heartbreaking and distressing news from Palestine and Israel, what few words we have we offer. We pray for the dead and for comfort for those who grieve, for the wounded and those on the front lines of healing, for the frightened, displaced, and despairing. Most of all, we pray for an immediate halt to the violence and a path towards just and sustainable peace, journeying alongside those who have never stopped dreaming and working toward that possibility. Our hearts are open, our hands stretch wide, our minds are attentive. May we live each day trusting you to lead and guide us always. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers which we bring in the name of Jesus the Christ, uniting our hearts and our voices in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I wasn't sure if you were laughing or coughing, but both. both? Yeah, I was. I thought there were verses. Okay. I thought you. I thought you did. I thought you did. Oh my! Moving swiftly along. Um... <laughs> Rejoice always, even amidst technical difficulties and... <laughs> oh my. Um, so, Allison, do you want to come up or are you supposed to come up and say something? I think so. Okay, Linda told you to, so that's what you got to do. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Linda's asked me to uh, come up and thank everybody for making the uh, homecoming weekend successful. Yesterday, that everybody that was here. Uh, I want to thank all the workers. We had lots of helpers, and all the people that that baked and brought books. And uh, on, on Friday night, I wasn't here, but I understand the movie was very successful as well. Yep, it was. So we thank everybody. It uh, it's been a great weekend, and uh, we had about uh, I'm told we had about 15 families from the apartments come down. <laughs> And uh, some of them, they were really overwhelmed that we were providing the food for free. And uh, they enjoyed it. So so I think all went well. I wasn't at the dance last night, so I don't know how that went. But awesome? Good. Good. So, so thank you to everybody. Yeah. That's Is that it. it? Thank oh, you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm going to just repeat what you said. Thank you for everything. Thank you for your donations of time and tents and talents and everything else. It was just, it was a good day and a good night too. The movie was fun, but remember, we don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> what else we got, Brandon? Oh, there's coffee downstairs today. Tea, coffee, treats, and a catch-up chat. Christmas Basket Committee has made the decision to resurrect a form of the actual basket this year. We'll be packing non-perishable items and providing a gift card to a grocery store for the perishable food items. The goal is a minimum of 70, and the list is available 
in the narthex of what, narthex of what we're looking for. Um, packing day of the baskets will be December 14th, and the handout day will be the 15th. And I think sign up starts November 6th, but hmm? it's changed from what was in the announcements. It'll be updated again. It has to do with um, brown bag lunch and harmony. P anyway, you can talk to Pe you can talk to Peggy and Pammy about that um, if you have any questions or um, anything you want to help out with. Book study starts this week. I have, I think, five people who've indicated they'd like to participate. If you, it's not too late, it is. Unfortunately, it's only available by ebook, which those of us who prefer something in your hand, it's a little um, annoying, but it's still a good book. <laughs> it's only five dollars. Send me an email. I can send you the link and the link to where you get the book. That starts on Thursday. Uh, Sherry and I are going to be meeting with any of the women who wish to get together to talk about the future of the UCW and other ways for the women of Harmony to meet and work together. Everyone is welcome to your, come on down, have a tea or coffee, and we'll talk. Did you know the purchasing of gift cards through Harmony is a fundraiser for our church? The order form and the brochure are out there in the in the narthex, so please check that out. Was there anything I'm forgetting? Anything can happen today. <laughs> so, all right. Well, all of these ministries, this community weekend, the Christmas baskets, the coffee and tea time together, the Bible studies, none of these things could happen without you. Your gifts of time, prayer, presence, and financial support expand Harmony's witness to God's abundant grace and love here in St. John and around the world. So may we give not out of obligation, but in hope for all that our gifts can do. Someone's gonna bring forward our offering as we sing Grateful. are the gifts of your people, O God. Bless their use as the gospel is faithfully proclaimed, as the suffering are supported and the grieving are comforted, as the hungry are fed, and as the faith community is nurtured on its journey. Amen. Thanks, Al. Don't we have another hymn? There it is. Okay. <laughs> Are you just messing with me? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, so remember we're talking about that circle and the closer we get to the center, the closer we are to God and one another, we are also called to expand that circle of God's love and grace and hope to everyone. So we will sing before we leave, draw the circle wide.
Beloved, whatever is true, honorable, and just, remember these things and go out and do these things. Whatever is pure, pleasing, and commendable, remember these things and go out to do these things. Rejoice in God, love one another, and as you go, trust that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.